<clears throat> Hello everyone, uh, my name is Karina Urquhart and I'm the Executive Director at BIC and your host for this BIC Brunch, uh, Making the Most of Thema, um, brought to you in collaboration with Editor, the organisation that manages and develops the Thema standard. In today's session, we'll be hearing about how bookselling experts are making the most of this international subject classification scheme and how you can work with them to maximise the discoverability opportunities that this scheme affords. We'll also discuss what can be achieved by using FEMA that can't be achieved by using BitCodes. <clears throat> and there'll be plenty of time um, at the end of the panel discussion um, for a Q&A session. So that's where we hand over to you, our audience. So some of you uh, may know that this is now the eighth uh, BIC webinar on the topic of Thema and why have we done so many sessions on this topic I hear you ask uh, well this is because the BIC standard subject category scheme or BIC codes as you probably know them um, are being made obsolete at the end of February next year so February 2024 um, our Thema sessions were put on to help the in industry the book indus industry transition um, through to that end of February date um, you can see the previous Thema sessions on screen there um, with their links, corresponding links to our YouTube channel. Uh, we have a, a playlist section dedicated to Thema, so do go and have a look. They're all free to, to view. Um, and you'll also notice there um, that there's a, a link to a set of operational FAQs, um, which is free to download um, to anyone. Do go and have a look at that. It's not about how do I classify X, Y or Z. Uh, title it's more along the lines of you know will onyx still work if i'm not using bic what do i do if my service provider or my systems vendor um, isn't yet um, using thema etc so that those those sort of more nuts and bolts questions so do go and have a look and help yourself um, we've got one thema one more thema training session um, before the end of february deadline and that's on the 16th of january and you can book that through the link there um, or you can go on to our uh, website and have a look at the training area there. Um, so don't worry about scribbling down all those links. Um, we'll be sharing the slides with you at the end of this session, probably to, probably um, sometime next week. And if you are using Twitter or X, um, I don't know what to call it these days, X, um, then mm -hmm. you can see the, the hashtag and the uh, our address there at the bottom of the screen. So before we get going, just some housekeeping. Um, we're going to invite questions at the end of the panel discussion, so please use the question box. You, look, you should all have a, a little toolbox on your screen, so there'll be a question box there. Use that. Pop your question in. Um, don't wait. You don't have to wait till the end of the panel discussion to use that, that box. So as questions occur to you, just, just submit them. If we've already answered the question, which we might as we go through, then obviously I, I, won't, I won't ask the question again. Um, the event's being recorded um, so that we can use it in our marketing and also to let people that weren't able to attend today um, have a look at the session. You might also want to refer back to it um, later on um, for your own references. And finally, just a gentle reminder that BIC is a neutral membership organisation and as such we politely ask that all attendees and all speakers strictly avoid any comments, conversations or questions that might be considered commercially sensitive or indeed anti-competitive. So what are we doing today? So here's the running order, quite straightforward. Um, I'll finish in a minute and then I'll hand over to our panel to, um, to, to facilitate their discussion. Then we'll have a Q&A session around about one-ish and we'll wrap up at 1.30. Um, I'll just talk, introduce our speakers very quickly. I won't ask them, I'll, I'll ask them later on to talk a little bit more about themselves, but we have Adam Hewson from Hewson Books, Simon Pallant from Gardeners, uh, Juana Maria Ruiz Martinez from Amazon, Chris Sainer from Editor, and Kieran Smith from Blackwells and Wordery, but we'll hear more from them in a minute. Um, so just very quickly, Bic, who are we? I'm sure there's some of you on the on the uh, on the call now who know exactly who we are, but there may be some of you who don't. Um, so for those who don't, 
We're a UK-based, not-for-profit members organisation operating at the heart of the book industry. We create standards, best practices and resources um, that many, if not most of your organisations will probably already be using. We help your organisations become more efficient, um, save money, become less wasteful and ultimately, hopefully, greener. We hold a unique position of trust, facilitating UK and international industry-wide collaboration to reach agreement on dependable standards and best practice in the supply chain. We do this in a variety of ways, including running five strategic committees, um, focusing on metadata, libraries, physical, digital and green supply chains. We offer training events and workshops and execute supply chain related projects for and on behalf of not only our membership but also the wider book industry. We also operate three industry recognised accreditation schemes but go and find out more um, on our website um, if, if you would like to find out what else we do. There's loads of free resources on there as well, lots, lots of interesting areas to go and have a look at. Um, but back to the purpose of today's session. As already mentioned, today's panellists will be sharing um, expert hints, tips and advice on how Thema is used by booksellers, what they need but aren't getting, and quick wins. Um, and also we'll be having a look at what the future might hold. Um, we've got a lot to cover off today, so I, I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm just going to hand over right now um, to the panel to introduce themselves one by one. Um, so as I call them out, hopefully they'll put their cameras on <laughs> so we can we can see them. Um, so let's start then with Adam Hewson, owner of Hewson Books. Right. Hello, I'm Adam Hewson. I'm at Hewson Books. Uh, we're two soon to be three independent booksellers in West London. Um, so I'm the owner of that. I've been involved with BIC for a few years now and been bookselling for decades. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. And um, next on my list, I have Simon Pallant from Gardeners. Morning, Simon, or afternoon. Hi, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I'm Simon Pallant. I'm the uh, Digital and Data Services Manager for, for Gardeners. Uh, I look after and have done for a number of years a variety of uh, IT-related um, um, services at, uh, at Gardeners, but uh, uh, relevant to this call, uh, I look after all things to do with data, either coming in, use of within the company, or, or ultimately uh, going out to our customers. Lovely, thank you. And um, then next I have um, Juana Ruiz Martinez from Amazon. I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly. <laughs> yes, hi, I'm Juana, Juana Ruiz. I work at Amazon. I'm an ontologist here based in Dublin. And in my team, among other stuff, we create the left navigation structures that you can see in Amazon. So those nodes have some rules in place that allow uh, books, in this case, to be classified. And for classifying the books, we use uh, Thema codes. So we create assignment queries, and an essential part of the queries are Thema classification codes. Lovely, thank you. Um, and then we have Chris Sainer from Editor. <clears throat> Hello, um, thank you. So I'm Chris Sainer. I work for Editor. So Editor is the organisation that um, <clears throat> uh, maintains and supports uh, Thema along with Onyx. Um, in, there. Dr. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, so editor do do um, do govern the, the, the standard. Um, so if you have any sort of detailed questions that you would like to ask them, please do. Um, and then finally, last but not least, we have Kieran Smith um, from Blackwells and Wordery. Thanks, Karina. Um, yeah, I, currently I look after Blackwells.co.uk and Wordery.com, which are quite different book selling sites and have different customer bases so that in itself is quite interesting when it look, looking at um, biblio data but I've been selling books online since 1999 I had a look at that that's slightly painful um, <laughs> and I've done that for various different brands and obviously we now sit within the Waterstones group so uh, getting involved with our teams as well. Great thank you and thank you to all of you for um, agreeing to take part in today's session. 
So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now because we're going to go into our panel discussion. So hopefully this will work. Just confirming that the screen has now disappeared. Right, lovely, thank you. Um, so I think the best way to start perhaps would be um, just to hear a little bit about maybe for the benefit of if there are any people out there that don't know what FEMA is <laughs> um, just very quick introduction to FEMA um, let's you know a little bit about the original idea for it how it came about what its purpose is how editor um, supports the standard etc <coughs> excuse me so I'm going to hand over before I reach, reach for a glass of water with my cough I'm going to hand over to Chris to um, give us a um, a, a run through whistle stop tour of thema thanks karina so yeah I'll, I'll just do this briefly um if you watch any of the videos that karina mentioned uh in her slide the, you'll see there's um there's quite a lot of information about more about thema so first thing i wanted to say is that thema has, is celebrating its 10th birthday it um, was launched uh october 2013 so we celebrated um frankfurt book fair the 10th birthday sorry there's a lot of background noise sorry there was a something going on um, um the um you were, you were talking about the you were talking about thema's 10th birthday sorry yeah there was just um it's one of those um yes sorry about that um uh, yes, yeah, so it's just celebrated its 10th birthday and um, so it's grown up, it's ready to take over from the Bitcoats. Um, why, why, why Thema? Why did the Thema come about? Um, if you think back uh, before Thema, there are, we work in a business where there's a lot of international trade, we use a lot of automatic communication, machine-to-machine -machine communication, and there are an awful lot of subject schemes, different national schemes, or industry specific schemes. So the UK had the big subject codes, United States has the BISEC codes, but there were lots of others. So people were having to do more and more um, independent, adding more and more different values from different subject codes, or relying on multiple mappings from code to code, from system to system, and it was becoming impossible. Um, so there was a need to create something that would allow uh, this global industry to, to carry on using one scheme, maybe for the national uh, uh, market, and then using uh, another scheme that could be used to communicate information, information internationally, and so Thema was born. Um, what is Thema? So just to remind you, um, so it's, it's a global multilingual scheme <coughs> that allows for the classification of book subject matter across languages, across cultures, and in all sections of the global and domestic book markets. So for those of you not familiar, it's made up of alphanumeric codes. Those codes are designed so they can be used in machine-to-machine -machine communication uh, or sent in a spreadsheet or whatever. And then each of those codes has a, a definition, a head, uh, uh, a label. And those labels are now currently available in 25 different languages. And that label just defines what that code means. And then along with that, there's notes, extensive notes that can explain how to use that codes, what they mean, etc. cetera. Um, Thema was designed to, to work uh, in conjunction with other metadata. So alongside what you can say in Thema, you can also look at information about age range, target audiences, formats, pricing, etc. to give retailers and booksellers a great choice, far greater choice in how they display that information. Um, Thema is not like some of you may be familiar with the US system BISEC. BISEC is a system of predefined shelf labels. So somebody's already decided in advance, this is what it's called. Thema works on the assumption, we're going to tell you what the book's about. Here's a code, here's another code. You can put two codes together and use it. And a bookseller retailer could display those labels as they are on our system, or they can use them to create their own. Um, and you can choose how to display that, what language you display it in, what terms. Okay, so that's a brief brief outline of what uh, Thema is. Lovely, thank you. And, and Chris, did you want to um, talk a little bit about 
you know, over those 10 years, how Thema has become integrated into workflows in, so, from what you're seeing? <clears throat> from what we're seeing, um, one thing I have to say, we are editor, so we manage, we manage the standards, We same thing with Onyx. We see these things, but we don't always know what, how people are actually using them. So don't yeah. always have full access to that. But what we've definitely seen over the last 10 years is um, that we are seeing more and more companies, more and more organizations uh, in different parts of the world asking questions about Thema or downloading the documentation that we have. Translations, the first version of Thema was available in four languages. We're now at 25. Um, so we're seeing that. We're also seeing more and more companies making um, Thema part of their metadata workflow, going for a Thema first workflow. So no longer relying on the code. If you companies working with the US market are doing a Thema and BISEC, uh, we're hearing that from companies are doing a Thema and BISEC natively classifying their titles um, to make use of both systems. So it seems to be coming more and more integrated into the workflow. Um, there was a very interesting presentation, um, which is available on our website, was done at our editor does a, a seminar at Frankfurt and Bloomsbury uh, did a presentation and it's very interesting to see a big academic company, how they've integrated Thema into their workflow. So that can be found on our site. And they're just one example of a company that's um, uh, how they've integrated that into their workflow. Great, thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering, in terms of sort of getting into the detail of the workflow, let's maybe we should ask our our, our booksellers here. I'm thinking I'm, I'm thinking of going to Adam first. To, to, from your end, Adam, as a, as a as a bookseller, what are you what are you seeing in terms of integration into workflows? Yeah, I think that. Uh... <laughs> We've got quite an interesting thing that Thema is ultimately for the end user is the bookseller and be it online or physical and and the customer, the ultimate end users of those. But for probably most independent booksellers, and I'm certain if I went to a high street uh, chain that if I were to ask the booksellers there, most don't really think about Thema from day to day. It's this sort of little unsung hero that goes behind the scene that is completely integrated into what we do but we never really think about it. Right. And the reason for that is the fact that we generally work off our um, uh, computer EPOS systems to book in books and to say where they are in the shop, or we're using a data provider like Nielsen or BDS or Amazon or Adavice or anyone else to look up books for customers. And then we see the, the words rather than the codes. So if we look at a book on Nielsen, we're, we're more likely to see the words. Um, so we'll know that this is a music book or musicians or uh, history of pop or whatever, rather than the little individual codes. So, so we don't really think about theme every day, even right. though it's in, integral to what we do. Um, oh, when you say you see the words, do you, what does that mean? Do you see the, do you well, see the theme, of word, theme of words or do you have the, an internal um, so, translation? So on uh, on if if we're to look at the the BDS or uh, Nielsen or wh whatever, we will see the the, the Thema code uh, qualifier names or right. subject names, and they'll right. they'll be in Thema format. Okay. We don't we don't see the Thema codes and, and, and numbers. Um, yeah. However, we then map those on to our own system. Because obviously, if you think about all the different uh, medical uh, thema codes there are, we just bung them all into health. You, you know, don't if, have if, a shelf if, for each one, then, Adam. <laughs> needless to say, we don't. You know, it's uh, <laughs> and and you know, uh, different um, booksellers will have a di different things. We have a couple of shelves of music. Some uh, smaller bookshop won't have any music at all, and they would keep their music books in possibly biography if it's. A David Bowie book or Kate Bush or something like that, Britney Spears, and yeah. just go straight into biography and wouldn't think about putting in music. So we need to be able to map it using Thema codes, mapping through our EPOS systems to, to work that way. And that's why there is one very critical thing for publishers is the fact that we only map on the primary code, the very first code. So 
if it is if, if Britney Spears is classified as music, it will go into music. If that's the first code, if it's the first code biography, it will go into biography uh, as the primary code because our EPOS systems can only cope with one. When we look up on on gardeners or whatever, it will give me all the the different codes. So it, so when we're investigating for a customer, we we rarely we use our EPOS system to find out if we've got it and it, where it is in the shop. If a, for a customer inquiry, we would go on to Gardeners or go on to Nielsen or go on to BDS or go on to Edelweiss and then see all the, the FEMA codes. And that's where we could look up children's books on bullying, which obviously we don't map bullying to that huge section in the shop. Yeah. You know, but, you know that qualifier would we, we would never have a bullying section it would just be we know that these 10 titles because FEMA helps us find them uh, on that subject yep okay thank you um i think it might be quite a nice idea to sort of talk about FEMA now and then spend a bit of the session talking about FEMA, what it might look like and what it might be able to do in the future <clears throat> um so what I'd like to understand from from this group is what's the current situation with regards to the quality of the uh, the data that you're all receiving, um, and what are any if it's not as maybe robust as you would prefer. What are the quick wins or what are the quick fixes, um, and what are publishers? not doing that they could be doing and vice versa well if there, if there is a vice versa um maybe there is what are they doing that they shouldn't be doing <clears throat> um so i'm just thinking who to start with on that one maybe um adam again let's pick on adam dave <laughs> <laughs> pick on me, yeah. no, uh, for the most part i think it is very good um there are certain things that you know, well, actually, it's often ahead of the game. So when we went to the new um, uh, version of FEMA, there were a lot of extra categories. Really, there are categories on that now? I didn't think that was a thing yet. So you know, it's it's often very good at finding categories ahead of the time. What isn't always good is the publishers using those categories yet. So we might find some of these new categories only have three books from them right now, because whether they retrospectively map previous titles into it, we don't know. Um, Again, I'll stress the the making sure the first code used is the better code, the best code that can be. Um, please don't use gift books as as a code, a primary code. Every book can be given as a gift. It's as simple as that. So it's not really a helpful thing to say this is a gift book. Um, uh, and age range we find is a real challenge as part of the qualifiers to make sure the books are age range that's very very useful the age ranging is it's not that specific it's usually from three to five or seven to nine which is good that's fine because we know that there isn't such a thing as a book that's suitable for every single eight-year-old but to have something is really really useful because what we have to do is if there isn't an age range we just map everything to one age group and and that's not helpful for anybody um, so do use the qualifiers. The qualifiers are incredibly helpful for us. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably probably my concerns with it. Yeah, are you? What are you finding in sort of? If you could put a percentage on it, what would you say in terms of you know titles that come with qualifiers and those that don't? Oh, that's a tough question. I'd probably say about twenty percent seem to come with qualifiers. Oh, okay. So there's yeah. quite a lot of quite a lot yeah. of work to be done by the sounds of it then now i i do something different for, for not every independent but a lot of independent because i run a website that i populate myself i look at these every time i put books on so i'm looking at the qualifiers every day when i put them on my website because i can say i don't i'm not limited on my website to have this book in the biography section i can have it in 10 different sections and if oh. I want to say it's 17th century Greece, I can have it qualified as 17th century and Greece, and and that's fantastic. But more often than not, I look through a publisher's list, and there's only six or seven books out of 20 that have uh, qualifiers on them. What? Right. Age ranging is a difference. So if I look at children's books, that's probably probably the better. When publishers do it, they're really good at it. 
Yeah. Um, without naming specific publishers, as there are some excellent children's publishers out there that really go on that. Okay. Great. And of course, it creates extra work for for you guys as well, doesn't it? If you if you if you're not given the qualifying information, or you, or you have to make yeah. assumptions, and um, with the best will and best intentions, they may not be the right assumptions. Um, yeah. Which is yeah. nobody's fault, but yeah. Um, going to move to Kieran now. Kieran, what's your um, take on the situation with Thema today? And what are the we, quick wins? <laughs> you might have to tell me to shut up in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I totally agree with Adam, you know, seeing lots of use of qualifiers around ages. Um, although, do bear in mind, I would say to publishers to, to make sure that the, the age qualifier being applied also sort of corresponds to the readership. Um, in the onyx if if you're using both because actually we're find, i'm finding that some of those are contradictory <laughs> which is a little bit worrying um i mean more use of qualifiers absolutely and if you're using qualifiers be really specific about you know use them to their best advantage um I mean, one of the examples i've given recently was a really good book on um east german history in the, that cold war period published in the last year which you know, sold loads of, really recommended heavily, does have qualifiers, but have qualifiers that are so broad that they really reflect the uh, classification, you know, the hierarchical tree rather than adding any extra. So it just puts it back into history, um, you, <laughs> puts into European history between 1900 and 1999, uh, which is obviously quite <laughs> broad, uh, and doesn't specify that it's East Germany, which of course the qualifiers will do. So I think for me, it's, it, you know, really look at them and think about, well, okay, what sort of audience do I want for this? What are the really interesting things about my book that I want to communicate? And what are the really relevant things? Because although, you know, uh, East Germany wasn't actually in the title, it was in, the, it was in the description and the synopsis, so you would get it coming up, but you won't yeah. surface it in a group of titles as quickly as, you, as we could if we had those qualifiers being populated. Um, and I see loads and loads of potential there because any area of interest within the long tail and within these thousands and thousands of books that are being published every week, we could start to clump, sounds a negative word, but we could start to bring them together in really interesting ways. And I'm just slightly frustrated, I suppose, that we're not using them to their best advantage. Uh, another example um, is, is around sort of the interest qualifiers um, and again I, I mean I kind of always raise the same title which is uh, The Good Hawk because that's a fiction title uh, for probably nine plus um, that has a, a character in it who has Down syndrome. Uh, it's not specifically about Down syndrome as a, as a book but it's certainly an, an interest that should be uh, highlighted with all the qualifiers and when the book came out the publisher did publicity with places like the Down Syndrome Association but it's not mentioned in the synopsis you know unless you really really knew that core area it would be almost impossible to surface uh, but there is you know there's 5 pmk uh, as a specific qualifier that could easily be applied to that that would then get it onto lists um, another example I've told you you might need to me to shut up, but uh, on autosense.com at the moment, uh, there's a page called, uh, which recommends different age group uh, books for dyslexic and reluctant readers. And at the moment, that's almost entirely manual. And it's, it's really driven by a list that the Book Trust put together and other bookseller recommendations. Now, from next year, what we would really like to do is drive at least the initial list that we could filter down from 5AR and 5AZ, for example. But unless a publisher has put those qualifiers onto the titles, they're not even gonna make it kind of into that bucket for us to, to make the selection from in the first place. Wow. Because we're not really gonna know, just from, again, looking at the jacket or the synopsis, whether or not it would be appropriate for a, that particular group. Um, I can, so the other, so I, I don't know. <laughs> one more, do one more, and then I'm going to move on to Simon. <laughs> <laughs> well, one other one. I just noticed in the bookseller um, update today. So the cent, the Centre for Literacy and Primary Education talked about the rise in diversity representation in children's books, and we are always getting asked by schools for recommended lists for particular 
areas of representation. I mean, it said in that article this morning, it's up to 30%. Now, if I look, I, what I did is I looked at some of the example titles in there. And actually the first one, which I'm not gonna mention the title or the publisher, but it's a big publisher. Uh, and the first book that's really, it's a good, really great book we've sold loads of, really great diversity um, representation in it. It had 15 subject codes and one qualifier which was just the age. Uh, now, interestingly, of those 15 subject codes, and this is a book for nine plus, seven of which were adult fiction ones, in order to try and hit the diversity, <clears throat> which means it ends up in completely the wrong bookcases, were we to, this is kind of why Adam's got that problem saying, well, let's just yeah. take the first well, one. Well, he'll, he'll take the first one. Yeah. Exactly, because we, which would have at least put it within um, children's fiction, uh, but otherwise, you know, if I start to try and work out, well, it could also sit online within adult diversity fiction, it ends up looking very weird and sitting next wow. to some very, very different books, which is completely not right. But had we got that qualifier in there, again, keeps it in the That's right true. classification structure, in the right, right part of the tree, uh, but gives us those extra elements to um, to actually get it to the right audience. Yeah. OK, brilliant. Thanks, Kieran. Some really helpful tips there, or advice even. Um, Simon, your thoughts on the state of the nation at the moment with regards to Thema and any um, what, what are you seeing and what are your sort of what would your advice, hints and tips for quick wins be? Oh, yeah, well, thank you. So I suppose that I have a slightly different perspective um, in many respects. I'm I'm aggregating data to to maintain a, a large books catalogue um, uh, for, for a wholesaler and also um, its customers. Um, we're dealing with thousands of, of publishers and distributors and, and uh, a collection of other data aggregators as well. Massive, massive data churn going on um, every single day. And in, in many respects, as, as Adam was uh, alluding to a little earlier, the, the you know, Thema is a, um, an unsung hero behind the scenes and um, it's a collection of data elements uh, sweeping their way through the uh, the systems and ultimately heading out in our, our feeds to customers. And so the, the biggest challenge for us is actually um, receiving uh, Thema um, data in the first place. Um, Really good take up um, from publishers and distributors within the UK and also Europe uh, in terms of providing FEMA natively. Um, less so, although gradually growing from, from US um, sources. Um, and you know, if, if we look at our two million line books catalog, um, in terms of um, receiving native FEMA, FEMA data, so native as in directly from the publisher, it's around about 40% of um, that catalogue. We have to then, in the background, because of that um, uh, shortfall, um, undertake a mapping exercise. Um, and generally, we have BIC um, for everything else, and we convert from BIC to FEMA in order to fill those gaps and maintain a solid FEMA supply to. Uh, all of our services and, and through our data feeds. So the the uh, the big thing for me is actually increasing that native um, uh, Thema supply from from our data suppliers. It is a wonderful global system, um, as as Chris was saying. It has multi language support, which is you know, incredibly useful. Yeah. Um, and um, we just need to uh, uh, get more of that data coming through the uh, the, the supply chain. Okay, so that's a, a call to action really, isn't it? To, to your organisations that are providing you with that data to, to really start to use Thema where they're not currently doing so. <clears throat> exactly. Okay, thank you. And then last but not least on this question, I'd like to go to Juana. Um, Juana, what do, you, what do you say with the sort of common mistakes that you're seeing? What would be your advice for sort of quick quick and easy things to correct those mistakes um, and uh, talk a little bit about best practices um, perhaps um, when when adding classification codes to books. 
Yeah, uh, well, first of all, I would like to say that we started to implement SEMA in 2016, and since then we have been increasingly implementing it in all marketplaces, and currently in our 23, I think we have now, marketplaces, there, there is SEMA as one of the main assignment method. The other one is BISAC. So we have these two main assignment methods. One is BISAC and the other is SEMA. And we don't actively maintain any other schemas except for JP where we maintain some NDC9. So uh, there's no point on adding BIC anymore. Um, that is important. We have still some legacy queries that are based on BIC, but we are trying to replace those as well. And it is rare that we have a, a big without a thema alternative so um that's one thing also qualifiers yes we use them in our, in our queries as well is the main way of classifying stuff in specific countries ages and uh time periods so qualifiers are essential one thing that this probably only applies to Amazon is that we have, a, well, the, if you have ever sent any uh, listing or anything to Amazon, you might have noticed that we have something called subject code. That is the attribute for the code. So we use that attribute for all the schemas that we have. And then there is a type where you need to specify if you are sending a BISAC, a thema code, a thema qualifier, what we receive sometimes are thema codes with different uh, types, so we cannot do anything with that. And overall qualifiers, sometimes we receive them as with the type thema code. So just be careful when you select the, um, the type because uh, if it's not valid, we cannot do anything, anything with that. And also there is no need on adding an specific, so a general code and a specific code, just be as specific as possible because we already have something in place that will assign ASINs to any node that has an, a general code, even if you added a specific code. So it, that's it's, uh, the best practice is always to have um, books assigned to the most specific um, code that you can find. There's also no point on adding 9, 10 or many classification codes because there's a cut there. So add the best classification codes if you want the book to be classified in, in the node. If you are looking for a specific node to classify a book, you might have access to Seller Central and there you can check the um, PTG uh, browse tree guides. So uh, in this guide, you can see which queries are associated to each node. That is not essential, to be honest. If just add the best thema that you can find, but if you need a guide, that is where you can find the, the guide. Also, if you want to assign your book to a specific node, the best way of doing it is just to looking at the node and looking at the thema, because that is how we create the queries. We associate it semantically most close concept to that we can find to that thema code uh, and i think that's that's it uh, so yeah. we have a lot of ti notes as well so if you have diversity and inclusion books be sure of adding those to them to the books so it sounds like you're saying accuracy and um detail in the yes nutshell it, the, they are the, the two vitally important um, areas for, for data providers to consider when, mm -hmm. when classifying and not to use exactly. big. <clears throat> yeah big uh, so it is possible to to add big I think uh, because our ingesting systems they are still allowed to add big but because the queries are not maintained it's better in any case to a thema because new queries new marketplaces they don't even have big codes so yeah. if you are adding thema you will be covered in all marketplaces yeah, yeah brilliant thank you um <clears throat> and i guess as well with accuracy there's an element of um trust as well so if as a, a reader looking for a, a new title on um, a specific topic if it's not categorized correctly um, there's a perception of um, 
I don't know, it could create problems, couldn't it, for for people sort of looking for certain topics if if the accuracy isn't isn't quite there. Have you seen any? Um, are there any sort of is there any feedback or comment um, any of our panelists would like to make on accuracy with regards to um, sort of engendering trust with the end user? <clears throat> Or any examples where perhaps that hasn't think, worked quite so well. I, I think sometimes it's it's kind of lack of, or, or there's a, a fear of kind of narrowing down a title to a specific. A spe you know, the more specific, specific. you come, you know, is there that fear that you're kind of putting yourself in a niche that that yeah. nobody's going to find it for other reasons. So I think there is a tendency sometimes to go really broad. Really general. Um, another example I was looking at recently was. Um, Again, a, a really good book that we've sold a lot of, so it's not stopped it selling, um, but of kind of usability um, for um, design, home appliances and equipment for those with additional needs. Um, but it was put actually in such a high art <laughs> classification that it was basically just art. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. that, that puts it in a, in a pot of, I don't know how many tens of thousands of books. And that, mm. You know, initially that sounds like okay. Well, I might re reach quite a big audience, but actually, I think for those who want to narrow it down and say I'm I'm really interested in design for those with additional needs, it would it, it you know that kind of feel the fear and and go for it. I think because yeah. actually it's it still going to be within that broader milieu, um, yeah. but for those browsing to a specific area, you're gonna you're gonna actually convert more people from that. I think. Yeah, and you you may you may miss. Your perfect audience. Well, completely. definitely. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we've talked about sort of quick wins and, and advice that we can we can give, um, and we're hearing about accuracy, uh, detail, um, etc. The um, are we finding that the what what's happening in the US? Are we finding that the US are encouraging the use of FEMA? What what's what's happening over there? Chris, did you want to talk a bit about that? I can start, but the others may have points of view. So there there is support for FEMA, official support for FEMA in the US. Your uh, sister organization, BISG in the United States, yes. is very supportive of FEMA. Um, there are uh, publishers that uh, that trade internationally in the US that are adding uh, theme codes um, but there is a also a tendency for some publishers just to see BISAC because they only look at the United States as a market and don't think about the international side of the trade and coming back to that question of accuracy it's unfortunate because the best thing you can do at a publisher is get the person who knows the book best to do the classification if you then rely on your distributor in Europe or in Latin America or in Australia to try and work out which code to put in, they're going to lose out on, on the accuracy of the person who knows it. Or if you rely on a mapping from ISAC to Thema, um, you're going to lose out as well because they're two totally different schemes and so you, get, you don't get it. But there is a growing awareness. Um, Canada is another market that um, uses BISAC a lot but would like to use Thema more. But, uh, isn't getting it. it, it um, when it comes to the United States and um, BISEC and Thema, Thema sits really well next to, 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 to BISEC. It gives possibilities for retailers in the US and outside the US to, to add that extra level of detail. But let's pass on to if anyone else has got. Yeah, does anybody else want to? Making observations? For us, BISEC is still the, the main classification scheme by far in the US. But we find sometimes gaps that, that BISA cannot cover because we have global trees and sometimes there are nodes that are relevant in some parts of the world that might not be as relevant in US, but we put them there anyway. And also Thema is usually more granular. So there are examples of, of nodes that have a Thema and don't have a, a bicep because there's no equivalent bicep that happens as well in, in US. So even if 
the BISAC code is still essential in US, it's also worth it to add a FEMA code because you might get a better classification for, for the book. Yeah. Yeah. Good we point. find that we find that when we're dealing with um, uh, organizations that uh, import American books to us, that it's very hard to get some um, classification and we have to classify those manually because they don't come across with uh, thema codes they sometimes come across with bit bit codes um it's not not all american publishers if what, what we find is american publishers that have uk offices they tend yeah. to have somebody who's done the work for us which which is excellent but it's it's some of the d d distributors that bring over dozens of small publishers or sometimes medium-sized american publishers that haven't been picked up by major people that we just don't we have to classify those manually yeah um simon kieran anything else to add on this before we move on i mean i was just gonna say i think we see a, a, a definite split between trade and academic um so actually academic publishers in the us being pretty good on that front um and you know either looking at using thema or, or giving us effective mappings um so we're able to to do that but trade publishing much less so <laughs> in fact to such a degree I, I don't i mean i don't know the american market perhaps as, as well as some of my colleagues here but um it, it, almost just nothing there <laughs> you know not even not even a, a bicycle code that we could map just literally nothing <laughs> so I, I think i don't know whether it's certain publishers or, or what but uh yes there's some um there's some uh, uh sort of promotional work needed i think in the us would be my suggestion on that front and it can lead just rather than the discover it's not so much an issue around discoverability on that side it gives us some work but actually can lead to problems in terms of it physically shipping the books because for some markets we need to know what type of book it is uh due to various you know, international challenges around that um no, no, I tend to echo um, that as well. The the uh, the, the big trade, uh, multinational trade um, publishers um, uh, certainly are, are very good at supplying uh, Thema, but there's a, a quick quick drop away um, after that, and then it picks up with the uh, academic um, sectors, and in particular the university presses uh, in the US, which are generally um, fairly good. Um, but it's that it's that middle ground there um, that um, uh, hopefully is improving, um, but uh, has a way to go. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just looking at the time. We we seem to be <clears throat> the clock seems to be ticking very quickly. Um, I thought we had more time. So um, in the interest of time, uh, I'd like to move on now to talk about the future. So where do we think Thema is going? What do we think the capabilities of Thema might be? Or what do we think um, organisations could be using Thema for in the future? Um, <clears throat> so you know, are we using, as an industry, are we using Thema data enough? Um, what else? Can we, how can we maximise it? So, Kieran, did you want to talk a little bit about um, the use of qualifiers and what people need to think about in terms of structure, hierarchy, and how they might use this this, this scheme in different ways to perhaps than they can give currently. it a go. I'll give it a go. Um, I, I mean, I I'm continue to drone on about Thema given any opportunity because I I do think it's really exciting. Um, even ten years in. I think I think we we have yet to sort of tap into its potential um, to even a tiniest percent. And I think although we're coming to this kind of we're coming to the sunset of BIC, kind of conceptually, I think as an industry we still think in very structured huh. hierarchical trees. And I think the market's moved on. I think customers don't shop books in that way. Uh, I think there are. So many things that the qualifiers would enable customers to discover. So many different themes within books, or so many different kind of aspects, so that the, we we haven't even anticipated. Uh, but we've what's really frustrating, I suppose, for me is that we've got this wonderful ability to do it, but we don't tend to we don't do it as much as we could do. We you know we barely scratch the surface in terms of what we're able to do on the website at the moment because we just don't have that data coming in. Um, and I suppose what, what I would say to publishers 
if you've got control over this is to take that kind of leap of faith and, and just do it and then work with us to say look you know it hold us to account if we then don't use it further down the stream um you know not a day goes past where i don't see an opportunity that's kind of missed because we didn't have that data there in the first place um and yet you know we've put the structures in as an industry it's very Anyway, repeating myself now but um yeah no uh, but it's, it's about anticipation isn't it it's put the data in even if you don't think you're going to use it now you might want to use it at some point further down the line yeah, you know, where, where we're able to kind of where we manually interact with that data so with uh account customers um which is sort of a third of the black world's business that the the our ability to custom create lists for the nhs or whatever is really driven from some of that granularity because we need to know, you know, what's an oncology book and what <laughs> where it sits and, and the sub subdivisions of that and very very which again isn't immediately obvious to publishers who may be populating that data somewhere and just thinking I wonder if anyone's ever using this, um, but it is being used perhaps behind the scenes more than people realise. I again the the opportunity for online for more browsing. You know, we're seeing people browse the sites more and more, whereas it used to be, you know, far more directed searches. Yeah. Um, again, being able to kind of surface this stuff and everyone says discoverability has become a bit of, you know, it's, it's kind of overused. But th this is thinking about your audiences, thinking about your customers and your potential customers um, yeah. and really just taking some time to populate those qualifiers so you can market your books effectively. It's as simple as that, really. Yeah. And it's, you said they're potential customers. I think that's really important as well, isn't it? It's yeah, there's customers guess, out there you may not even know. Exactly. Um, and it could it could be customers who've got a very specific interest in reading fiction about a very specific period, or it could be, you know, it, it, people are fantastically diverse and and interested in weird and wonderful things. You know, one of the great things about being a bookseller is being able to surface <laughs> these, these books for people, um, and yeah, loads of loads of potential there. I do worry that the audiences that come to these things, of course, are all probably nodding in violent agreement. They kind of <laughs> self-select. <laughs> so the, so the job of the job of the audience here is to go back and kind of convince your colleagues that they're missing a trick. You know, don't. Yeah. When when often we'll go and invest large sums of money in advertising or PR or whatever. Great, keep doing those, but actually, you've got this as a free um effective way to to get your books out there that you're just not taking advantage of yeah free and has a uh, long legs has longevity to it as well it's um Absolutely does. you know Absolutely. It, it's always there yeah um thank you um can i add something to that yes of course you can yeah. yes I, I think that um just sounding old and cranking and say we want this very simple think about the first um code that you use I don't think it should be forgotten that the beauty of the way Thema works is that you can be complex with that wow. and you can use all those qualifiers are, do, are doing that. So one of the the bonkers new ones that, that came up was, um, I've looked it up, it's the uh, romance for the famous, the rich and the powerful that I didn't think was a subject before. Now, if, I, if something gets qualified as that, our old systems are quite happy to just put that in the romance section, the fiction section. So if that's used as the primary uh, thing, that's best. That's the perfect thing to do because we'll still pick on that. It doesn't go into the ether. It doesn't go in some strange place. That's the beauty of the way Thema works is that, it is that you can be specific as long as you're not putting it in gift, please. <laughs> yes, yes, I've written that down. Um, so any any other thoughts for anybody else on uh, from uh, you know what we think Thema can be doing in the future? What about um, what about I'm going to go there. What about AI? Um, can AI be taught anything with regards to Thema? Do we think, Juana? What do you what are your yeah thoughts uh, yeah definitely. So everyone knows that LLMs or artificial intelligence is just like the big thing these days and classifying books you can try with chat gpt and ask chat gpt to add some thema codes you will be surprised it's um, 
not super accurate, but you can have some ideas. But in apart from that, just having the correct metadata into books, that definitely will help to train, even if you want to, it will help to train um, artificial intelligence behind. So it will get more and more accurate. And just having raw metadata in your book won't be helpful for you because it won't be taken by, by the artificial intelligence in the right way. And I think more and more artificial intelligence will be integrated in big companies like well, like Amazon for sure and, and in everybody's life actually. So there is a future there for, yeah. for them as well. I'm not sure what will be the future, but definitely it, there is a future there. Thank you. Uh, Chris, any thoughts about AI? I'm sure you, I'm sure you do with regards to Thema. Yeah, I mean, AI, um, big topic, but there's hmm. a lot of possibilities for, 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 for many good things to be done with um, large language models and artificial intelligence. But, and yes, it could be, you can create models that will give good suggestions for how a title should be classified. Again, depends what data it's using to train it. If you train it on bad data, then it's probably going to carry on giving you bad results. If, if you're using any sort of classification scheme inaccurately and and always trying to use a scheme to for the wrong reasons and not to actually put it in thinking of your reader but thinking of marketing and things like that if you train it on bad data then ai is not going to be any good but yes i mean there are people doing experiments and as with all these things the more they do the, the better it gets i saw somebody doing a report about one in spanish and they were saying it's interesting but we've taken more time writing the queries putting it into chat gbt then checking the results and then actually curating them then it would have been just to add the codes yeah. at the moment but yeah it, it could be very helpful it can be could be something that will help bigger companies surface some of those wonderful qualifiers qualifiers are brilliant that you may not think about mm. um because it can also be used to because we put in all those notes, we put in the words to try and help people find the right codes, but there are, English language is wonderful, but we do tend to have 30 ways of saying the same thing sometimes. And you don't always find the right thing because you think of it, I'm looking for this, so I'm searching that, but I don't actually find that because we all call it that or that. So I can I can see great potentials for, for <coughs> AI. Okay. Um something to watch out for I guess and something to learn uh, as we go forward so any other thoughts on AI before I move on anyone no okay um, I'm just gonna talk just gonna touch very briefly on um, diversity and inclusion and we did um, if my memory served me correctly um, Chris we did a, a, a theme of brunch on that topic didn't we um, I think it was last year mm -hmm. Um, so there is a, a sort of a, a more comprehensive recording available on our YouTube channel, but I just would like to talk about it in context of the future of Thema. Um, and Juan, if I may, uh, when we last spoke, you 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 did mention um, you had some thoughts on this with regards to your um, diversity and inclusion work at, at Amazon. Did you want to talk anything any more to that? Um... I think uh, so. It's probably that also we every time that a new Thema uh, version is released, or even if we identify a gap that we don't have a, a node for a specific uh, diversity and inclusion, we are always reviewing uh, auditing diversity and inclusion. So Thema has offered us the possibility of adding classification codes to to those nodes, and. I, I think what I mentioned was uh, regarding to big. So big doesn't have, of course, because it was yeah. discontinued a long time ago. So it doesn't have a new classification codes for new diversity and inclusive topics. So it is important to use Thema in, in that sense. Um, and I think on to, to, to that as well, Fuana, thank you for the reminder. Um, yes, there are some um, elements in BIC um, along those lines, but they are very, very, very old and um, not as yeah. socially acceptable as, as, as they are 
as they would be um, back when they were first created. So we, we don't really recommend that, that they get that they're used at all. It, well, we don't recommend using bitcoins at all anymore because they're <laughs> they're being made obsolete in February. But um, you, you get my gist. Um, but yes, very important topic, and and Thema handles it so much better than um, the big codes did. Yeah. Um, can I can yeah. I say something about that? That's a very good point. Um, <clears throat> big was has been frozen for many years, and the way language uses has we use language changes, and because Thema is is a living thing, we can revise the wordings we use. We try and make sure we have balanced neutral wording to try and reflect. Um, contemporary usage, because we never seek to offend with words we use. Um, we also try and create something that's understandable, but we can also add new concepts in as they're needed. So the other thing we always stress is you do not have to use the terms we use. Um, we try and define a code, but as Adam has, has um, very clearly stated, a, a bookshop can choose to use its own, ter its own terms, its own preferred wording, for diversity subjects as well. So language yeah. language is really important. Oh, definitely. And then that's the that's the brilliant thing about Thema, isn't it? I'm just uh, probably going to repeat what you've just said, but it 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 is future proof. It's it's that's one of the reasons behind it was was to provide a future proof multilingual um, diverse scheme that adapts and reacts to um, language and and society societal changes, etc. Um, throughout its lifetime. So yes, totally agree. Um, anything else to talk about the future? Kieran, did you want to talk anything about um, creating markets where perhaps markets weren't realised before, or do you think you've you've already covered that um, in previous? Well, probably bang on about that <laughs> already. Okay, um. Simon, did you have anything you wanted to talk about in, with regards to the future? Where you you would you you think Thema might go, or where you would like to see Thema go, or where indeed you'd like your um, data providers to to progress to? Um, not specifically. I mean, the the um, you know, the, the, I would sort of hop back to the fact that you know Thema is a is a truly valuable. Um, so it is a global service. It's hugely popular with our um customer base uh, uh globally um we use it uh, internally within our business for all kinds of analytics purposes and creating you know, anything anything from seller lists um for uh, for uh, customers to um uh, even creating um you know um, niche filtered um uh, data exports for um our customers as well um, so I think I think it has a very um, promising uh, future. It's, it's had a great start and, and uh, um, is hugely useful. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, my our particular use of it is is slightly um, um, you know, different to, to, to Adam and Kieran. Um, it's it's uh, in many respects a data element for us, um, but a wonderful one at that. Yeah. I completely agree, as I think do all the panel and hopefully all the audience as well that are they're watching at the moment. Um, any last words on the future? Adam, did you want to talk about the future of Thema, where you'd like to see it going, what you'd like from data yeah. centers in the future? It'll be interesting what else we can do and having some various conversations over time about with other people about things that could happen and all controversial, of course. Um, you know, things like having, you know, uh, Scottish literature or Irish literature, or, you know, we appreciate there's the problem with uh, English literature and in that sort of thing, but different countries' literature, so you can get things together. So I shouldn't forget the Welsh in there, um, or, or other countries, but to have different countries' literature as, as a, a subcategory or, um, but really all I can do is uh, um, reiterate what Kieran's saying about using the qualifiers so much better so that you know if a book is about a time and a place you know that that time might be you know, 2010s or it might be 1990s and it's in Birmingham or something like that that it's really useful to have that because when we're when someone's saying you know I'm going somewhere on holiday can you re recommend some book, books there and you go oh yeah you're going to Greece is 
Captain Corelli's mandolin again. You, know, you want to be able to say, you know, where all these new books that we might not have read yet, this is this one's based in Greece. This one's based in I seem to be on in Greece today. Uh, this one's uh, set in Greece. This one's set in Italy, and so on. He, these are good holiday reads for things that we haven't had a chance to read yet. So those qualifiers are really brilliant, just for the basics, as well as much more in-depth subjects that might be useful in the future that we don't know of yet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, any final words before we go to our Q and A session? I just want to support the qualifiers thing. I've got a personal recollection. I went into a large bookshop and um, just at the start of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the customer was saying, "Can you? what books have you got on Ukraine? I found one history book, but what literature? And the bookseller was being a very good bookseller. Booksellers do what they do best, hand, you know, looking for things in curation. But that bookseller had no access to any information. Imagine if the titles had the Ukraine place qualifier. Oh. How many more books that bookseller would have been able to? Yeah. And I, another one, I heard a, um, I was doing investigations looking for example titles of diversity and inclusion and I went into a bookshop and the bookseller, I asked uh, for some recommendations uh, in the children's sections. She said, well, we keep a list at the till, at the cash desk, we write out, when we come across titles, we write them out. I wish publishers would tell us this. I wish there was a way publishers could tell us this information. Obviously, as a bookseller, as Adam says, booksellers aren't always aware of the word theme, but it's there. Yeah. There's a potential to sell far more books. That's the basic thing. You can give more information, sell more books. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and Adam, I think when we when we spoke prior to this session, you, you were talking about the impact on walk-ins, uh, similar to, to Chris's observation there. That um, you know that that you, you it's not you may get walking people just coming in well you will get people walking into your bookshop saying do you have a book on this do you have a book on that or where can i go yeah. for x y or z and and it's really useful then um, when it's in your system to be able to just pull that up yeah obviously it's not on um, our epos system which just has the single category in it but we can go into yeah. um, into some of the data providers and there's a place that we can put a theme of code in so if somebody's looking for children's books on bullying we can just put bullying in there or you could put ukraine in there um, or if you're not sure, you can you can actually click the button in in um, one of the providers, and it will give you the theme of codes. So you can say, ah, that's what I need to do to find that, you know, Egyptian history between the third and fourth dynasty or whatever. You know, that you not not we get many of those, but all the same, <laughs> you you can actually look that up through uh, some of the data providers to find that. And yeah. um, who knows, we may even get that into a more usual systems and more systems that are used more often from people yes yes that would be good that would be good okay great any final words before i move on to to invite questions from our audience last chance no excellent thank you very much um really good conversation there i think but i'm biased um so just looking then at the questions box let me just put my screen up as well so just to remind people um, right there's a question box on your or um, well, you should have it you should have a little tool box a little toolkit um, as you're signed in as attendee so if you do have any questions there is a question box I think there's a little drop down do feel free to put some questions in there I can't see anything at the moment let me just double check so nothing yet, but I can fill in while we wait for some to come come through. Um, so I was going to ask Chris, um, in terms of new subject categories, what's the process? How does it work in terms of, um, you know, if I'm a, a bookseller or a publisher and I'm, I'm looking through Thema and I can't quite find the subject area that I think would fit my title what what how do i how do i go about seeing if i can get a particular topic added to the, the list that's on thema what, what happens so there um so thema is on a two-year cycle that we do updates roughly every two years um uh, so 
the next one will be 1.6, they'll do out in October 2024. So what we do when we're doing that is we have a list of suggestions and now those suggestions come from various sources. They come from people who have contacted uh, editor or gone to our Thema um, implementers list and asked a question, how do I classify this book? And or how these books, because we have loads of books about this topic. Sometimes that's a question of the fact that, like I was saying, with language, people use different terms for the same things or they can't quite find it. So sometimes it's a question yeah. we need to add new things to the notes. But sometimes it is a good suggestion. So come straight to us. We collect those or there are systems of national groups. So the United Kingdom has through BIC uh, a UK group. Um, so if you work for UK organizations, you can send them to BIC uh, or to and they will take it to the, the UK Thema group and they will yeah. discuss it. And do you think it's uh, worth going through to the next stage? What we do is then we compile a list that goes to all our different national user groups. We discuss them. We form a working group, which is meeting at the moment. They discuss it and they look at it in detail. Do we need this? Is this actually something where we need a new code or is this just an existing concept? Can this be expressed easily by using a code and a qualifier? Um, that kind of thing. So yes, um, those are the ways. So either contact editor or go to your national group um, yep. in the UK, go to BIC. I think as well as from you know what you've just said there, it's just really important to, to re-emphasize, isn't it, um, Chris, that theme is not static it's constantly being yep. reviewed assessed hearing feedback hearing comments internationally um about what can be different what can be added what what may even need to be deprecated um yeah we haven't started deprecation yet um we haven't deprecated any codes what no. we're also trying to do is that it becomes too big i mean it's got to remain something yeah. that people can use um so we often try and expand the notes or say look this is a concept this is a, just a new way um so lots of people in, in English are now using the word romanticy, but we basically we have romantic fantasy already, but we don't use the word romanticy, but it's being put together. So we now have to add that to the notes. So if somebody's looking for just that term, they find it, but we don't need to add a new code. Uh, we're not adding a new code. We won't add a code for new adult as a as a genre because we have a qualifier Other that we we have a qualifier for what people call new adults we use it we we term it in a in a more comprehensive way so and there is a thing with people not always realizing you can use a subject code and a qualifier together to create that concept we don't need a subject code for it because we're not a pre-coordinated system it's it's about yeah. using bits of data so there's also we get people saying i need something to say this is a hardback picture book uh no that doesn't go in thema that goes in on it or something else so we also try and um weed out the the obvious things but but yeah. um the the thing i'd encourage people to do, do is to join the thema implementers list and ask the question to the thema user groups the wider thema community and get the discussion going because what's interesting to know is is this just one publisher with a book or are there loads of books coming out about this topic in different parts of the world yeah do you do you have a limit um a lower limit chris on, on how many books there should be before you would consider a subject edition uh, we don't have a fixed limit but we do have because it's so we're doing a lot of work on ind indigeneity at the moment so books about the indigenous peoples of the americas australia etc they're very small groups and there aren't many books but those books are hard to find so the number of titles maybe in some of those topics may not need to be the same as suggesting a new romance category where there are tens of thousands of books coming out about a new i don't know royalty romance um for example you know which is expanding so do we need a new code for it so we would look at we would look at any suggestion in context with the the that that yeah. sub that okay. the subject and can and, it be done it, in other ways? And if it can't, then yeah. Yeah. And to stress, it's not editor that makes those decisions. It's our it's our user groups, it's the working group, and then it's the international steering committee. There is a system of governance <coughs> and decision making that's um open and democratic. Yes. 
And that International Steering Committee meets twice a year, doesn't it, at London Book Fair and Frankfurt Book Fair? Does indeed, yes. Yeah. Okay, um, we do have some questions coming in. Let me just go to these. Uh, so I've got one question coming in. Uh, in our company, we always use, we're always advised to have the first theme of code to be as broad as possible, containing only the general discipline, for example, linguistics, and then follow it with more specific uh, ones. Um, uh, would it be more advisable then for the first code to be as specific as possible with classifiers? From what we've said, I think the answer is yes. But I will uh, defer to our panel. Uh, from from a theme point of view, and in the the advice we give in the best practice, that doesn't reflect the advice we give at all. That sounds like I've seen that advice in relation to BISAC before, um, oh. as one of the. Uh, and I know BISAC have done uh, communication about trying to stop people doing it like that. Um, it's not even good advice. It's not even. It's. I mean, because they don't think it's good advice for BISAC either. No. So nobody really knows where this advice has mm. come from, because they're no. hierarchical. Um, as Wana pointed out, their algorithms can automatically will do the necessary to put it in a, in a higher thing. So, can I just say diplomatically, that's really poor advice. I would go. You've got to look for the 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 most appropriate code should be the main subject. As Adam yes. said. You know, they're going to use the main subject. Choose the most appropriate code. Sometimes that might be a broad general code, but sometimes it's a more specific one. Yeah, and I think no, if your topic is is specific, it depends on the book, doesn't it? If the book's a specific topic, then you need to be as specific as possible, um, and then let let the booksellers um, determine then whether they go with the more general piece or they go with the more specific piece, depending on how they're structuring their virtual or, or um, physical store. Don't forget that Thema is designed as a as a code structure with hierarchy so that you can cut it back. So Adam, yeah. they don't have a medical section, you know, uh, whereas Kieran said they need that detail. Yeah. So Kieran Blackwells is going to look for the detail detailed code and which is what the publisher should be putting in but adam's going to make the decision if they have any titles that start that have an m code they're just going to go in one health section yeah but that's because that, you've cut the options yeah. haven't you you've cut the options yeah. for any other interpretation but adam knows they're all medical because all codes start with it, medical codes start with m so he knows that that there he, you do not need to put the m code in as well yeah that, okay. that's absolutely right yeah and the some of the more technical things we can say well all of these go into reference or science or whatever except for these few agriculture books which we might put into nature so we can pick the one category out of the full um uh, first one or two letter list we can take yeah. two or three of the big ones and move that to another category if we want. so and, and for independent book selling we're going to be using the mapping that's either Edelweiss gives us or Gardlink gives us or Bertline gives us or whatever. We're not writing that ourselves. So somebody else has done that for us. Um, obviously, for chains and other booksellers, they'll, they'll do it a different way. But we have to have that simple system that you know, the mapping is incredibly simple. We just have to decide ourselves at the beginning. And if we don't know, we just put everything that starts with M goes into, in my case, health. Nice and easy. Yeah, but if you cut so if that, you cut that, the detail out, you you yeah. cut your limit. You limit your options, don't you? If you take, if you don't put the detail in, and it, if if you can have sort of two or three subjects, you know, let's go to this crazy um, rich, famous, and powerful romance thing. That's just going to go into my fiction section. But it it say well, it's also it's got some witches in it, so you can put you know supernatural fiction in it as well as a second subject. Huh. But if you feel that you have to have Fiction is the first subject. Romance is the second subject. Uh, third subject is rich, famous, and powerful romance. You're using up all your options, and you end up with 20 different categories because you're using the top level. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that the secret is to provide as much as you can so that different booksellers, because um, different booksellers will have different requirements um, yeah. and different levels of detail and different shelves and different organization of their stores um 
I think it's just important to give them as much information as you can so that they, they can make the choice. <clears throat> um, anything else on that? I've got one more question that's come through. Um, anybody wants to comment on the one we've just can had? I, can I just clarify something you said, Karina? When you said you're, what you meant was provide as much accurate information as you can, not as many codes as you can. Oh, no, sorry, as much accurate information as you can. <laughs> I know. I know what you yeah. mean. I just wanted to make yeah, sure it's yeah. clear. For the um, avoidance of doubt, yes. As you notice in um, a German example on raising hens, somebody added 174 thema codes on okay. raising uh, raising hens. That's so accuracy. <laughs> but, yeah, because yeah, I think we said what we say about. It. Oh, Kieran, I think we've have we lost you. You've frozen. Come back to you when you unfreeze. Um, should I just go on to the next question while we wait for Kieran to unfreeze himself? Um, somebody's asking, could you please explain how BISAC and Thema differ apart from BISAC being US based and Thema being global? Um, again, I think it comes down to specifics, doesn't it? But I. I... Yeah. BISAC is specifically created for the US book trade. It's what's called a pre-coordinated scheme, which means that you have a code that's put together in advance and basically they have re they have created your shelf label for you. So with a BISAC code, uh, you say this book goes in this, this section of the bookshop. So that's what it's done. There's no... There's no notion of, of if you use this bisect code and this bisect code, you're creating greater meaning. You're just saying, I think you can put it on this shelf or this shelf. Thema is designed to be to work. You can use Thema very simply, just use one code, or you can use it as a faceted search, which means that you use subject code plus qualifier, subject code qualifier, um, information that you find in your other. That's how Thema is designed. That's the major difference. Thema, of course, is also international and global. BISEC takes a purely US point of view, which is normal because it's a US scheme um, yeah. designed for US bookshops. Um, Thema has to be global. Um, maybe, I don't know if any of the others have any. Would you say Thema is a bit more, um, what's the word? Flexible is not the right word, but it, it's more adaptive. Yes, I would because it has to be because it's yeah. because of what it's trying to do. I mean, yeah. BISEC is. The BISEC codes are brilliant for what they're for. They are for the United yeah. States of America yeah, and for absolutely. the US. That's what they were created for. And they do a very good job. A lot of volunteers put a lot of time into maintaining that. There's a lot of work in that. But they are designed for a, a specific market that sells books in a specific way. They're not designed to sell books in Mexico, New Zealand, South Africa, Indonesia, Japan, you know. Whereas Thema is trying to make sure that it is as inclusive as possible. So we're trying to be a friend to everybody, but maybe not anybody's best friend, I don't know. In the sense that we're trying to create something that works, and there's always gonna be weaknesses because we can't satisfy everybody. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think that's all the questions we've got. Oh no, there we go. Here's one more question. <laughs> Two more, I think. Um, will BIC coding disappear in the next five years? Uh, I was, yeah. Do you think BIC coding will disappear in the next five years? Um, if that means will BIC codes disappear? That we are removing all reference to them at the end of February. There'll be nothing on our website. There'll be no help or support given with regards to any bit code queries or anything like that. Um, as for coding, um, if you mean people still using bit codes, I suspect that may still happen, but it's not something that BIC or um, editor would support uh, because they're out of date. They're, I think, 10, 12, maybe more years out of date. They're not current. They can't do, as we've just heard, they can't do um, anywhere near as much um, work that, that the theme and codes can do um, 
And I think you, it would be a limit on discoverability to only use the bit codes or even just to continue using them. Um, Chris, what do you think? Um, they, they, you know, they're, they're, they're codes. They they were structured they codes. Work. They'll remain in the system, systems yeah. and things like that. I think any organization that's using resources uh, on BIC uh, by the end of 2024, you know, you should be questioning how you use your resources. If, you, if you're still putting resource into classifying using the BIC code, and as Karina says, they haven't been updated since 2010, so they're, they're dated. But they won't go away. They'll be in, you know, they'll, they'll be in, in legacy data and things yeah. like that, and people will be able to consult them. But I would not. I would say companies should not be using resources on on big subject codes after no. February. If you, I would say, if you know, if you've got a limited amount of time to classify your books, which I suspect all all um, publishers and and other data providers do have a limited amount of time, um, you'd be better off spending that time using the Thema codes. Um, I I wouldn't spend time on reclassifying anything with a, with a bit code. Um, would be my ideal recommendation. Obviously, you know, some trading partners aren't yet there with Thema codes. Some will still need bit codes, and and that's down to sort of individual trading partner relationships to to discuss. But um, yeah, I think if you if you're time poor, opt for the Thema code. Definitely. I would say if if you have trading partners that are clinging on to the old bit codes. Fine, but don't waste resources. Talk to a technical team and just put into place an automatic backward mapping. There's a yep. very good mapping from the back to big, and then they could be added into your metadata. But don't 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 spend time on them. You don't need to clean them out. You don't have to remove them from your no. data if they're already there, unless you get yep. a specific request from one of your trade partners. But yeah, yeah. the operational um, the operational FAQs um, answer quite a few of those types of queries. You know, will Onyx still work? What if my trading partner doesn't want to use, or isn't yet ready for Thema codes, et cetera, et cetera. So do have a look at the, the operational FAQs on the BIT website. They're free. You don't have to be a BIT member. Um, just go and help yourself, download them and have a look. And hopefully your question will be covered off. Um, I just have a question as well. How are um, UK regional uh, subject categories or uh, qualifiers um, arrived at? What are they? What are they based on? That's the question that we've had ahead of this session. Is that for me again? Probably. <laughs> um, yes. So the, the place qualifies for so the structure of Thema uh, went down to countries, and then underneath each country, it's very much up to the the users in that country to to suggest. So for the UK, the original suggestions were probably based on what was some of what was already in the big subject in the big scheme but also what the uk user group which is uh, uh managed through big the organization suggested so when you look at the uk there's a different approach for england for scotland for wales and for northern ireland and that was very much reflects <clears throat> the feedback that the uk group got from users in the in the, the four nations um so they it's 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 undergone some updates as new as things have been added but i think it's it sort of reflects how general bookshops probably reflects how general bookshops um divide their books in the uk and it's the same so when you look at you look at another country it's divided up into a completely different way but that reflects how people think of their <clears throat> book selling in that country yeah so that's how people qualifies and again if there are things that are missing, if there are suddenly loads of books on, oh, um, I don't know, if there's suddenly loads of books on the Isle of Sheppey, for example, I think it may be in a note, but there isn't a subject, but there isn't a qualifier for that. You know, again, go contact the UK Thema Group and say, look, we think you need to suggest a new place qualifier for this. Okay, thank you. But, um, but can I just say that Thema is not a gazetteer. We're not trying to cover everywhere. It's it's things where there are books. It's about books. Um, you know, there was a couple of countries when they first joined who submitted lists of basically everywhere in their country. And that's not what Thema is about. Thema is about books and are there books on this subject? And that's what each set of place qualifies. 
and it's much easier to add things later than to try and rearrange things. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, just wondering if I should ask this question. Um, if 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 if, a, if somebody's got a collection of books all around the same theme, and there are a variety of different types of books, so uh, novelty items, gift books, coloring books, biographies, novels, etc., could they use the one thema classification for those um, if if they're all on the same topic? So. Can I, I'm going to, I'll take this first. When you're looking at thema subject classification, you cannot look at that on its own. You've got to look at your supplies to any aspect of information about metadata. You have to look at it in the context with everything else. So yeah. Onyx or another way, you you, you describe form. Um, it's it's a picture book. It's a hardback. It's a, you know you describe that elsewhere. And then if 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 the diversity of your collection comes from other things, you describe it from there, and then you're just going to use the the gardening code in in Thema because they all happen to be about gardening. But it's the rest of the metadata which is equally important. It's what retailers need. It's what Simon needs at Gardeners. It's what all three retailers here need. The other metadata yeah. as well. So don't look at Thema on its own. Look at the other things as well that go with it. Yeah. Yeah, because the theme, theme is not about the format of the book, is it, or the, the product? No. It's about the subject of the content, yeah. um, not about the and shape are, it's in. And there are other things that you can do. So, for example, if you publish, if your speciality is you publish only books on Napoleon, for example, everything to do with Napoleon, using that because of the film. There's a thing in Onyx called Name a Subject, where you can say this beautiful structure that you can give and say, look, this is the subject of my book, or this is the main character in my novel, and that can that can even carry an identifier, um, which is a different oh. discussion. But you can give detailed information like that in other aspects, because Thema can only go so far as well. I mean, yeah. we can't have a code for we can't have a code for for uh, different you know everything that exists. We don't have a, a code on Napoleon as a as a historical person. Good advice, thank you. Um, so I think we're going to have to wrap up because we are slightly over time, as I thought might happen uh, when we started. So um, I will thank our panel uh, in a moment. I'm just going to wrap up first of all. So thank you to the audience members as well for submitting their questions. Um, so let me just play around with my screen. So. Um, to wrap up then in summary um we had very early on there are um, some organizations that are doing thema first implementations um and the thema generally is becoming more integrated into the book industry workflows in general terms however there's probably room for improvement it sounds like uh, not all um data senders are using thema at, you know for, for all of their products um some booksellers only map using the primary code and age range is important. Um, we've heard today that Thema could be used more proactively and extensively, um, particularly using qualifiers. Um, I think that, that, that probably one of the main themes from, from today's session is, is all about the qualifiers, um, particularly for long tail niche backlist as well. Um, and we've heard about how, how using the, the qualifiers um, in a meaningful way can actually help raise the level of discoverability um, and can really get the, the you know long tail backlist moving um, and you can really you know get into specific targeting um, there using that level of information um, I think we've heard as well we'll agree that the, the booksellers find the qualifiers exceptionally helpful so please do use them um, Thema can definitely help curate um, for diversity, equity and inclusion content um, and can really help with that discoverability. <clears throat> um, and again, just to sort of 
keep repeating, um, be as specific as possible when classifying, um, not only with the, the codes, uh, but also with the qualifiers. Um, and in terms of the future, what we're seeing is, um, you know, we heard from Kieran there that, that customers are browsing and exploring content in different ways than perhaps 10 years ago or even five years ago. Um, and we'll con con continue to do so. And, and that behavior will, will probably change again over time. Um, we're not any, we're no longer looking at siloed searching um, and it's granularity of data and classification that will be key both, well, both now and, and in the future. Um, I think it's important to, to stress that, you know, put the data in. If you know the data, put it in now. You may not have a use for it today, but it may become invaluable um, in the future. And we've heard more generally about how responsive adapt and adaptable the thema scheme is, that it can flex and react and adapt to language and societal changes. And it's future proof, basically. So, um, and, it, and I think, I can't remember who said it, I think it was Adam, it's a hidden gem. Um, it's working away in the background um, and can provide a longer, longer term source of um, information and uh, Sort of background information and and you can you can create new lists your marketing lists and and, and really explore um your catalog uh most effectively by by using thema in, in ways perhaps that you haven't thought of before so um just before we go i would like to thank our panel today um just get my notes so I'd just like to, to thank everyone, thank the, the attendees for coming. I'm sorry we, we ran over um, over time, but I think it was it was worth doing. Um, so stay in touch if you would like to find out more about what we're up to at BIC. Um, you can join our mailing list. You don't have to be a member to join the mailing list. Um, you can stay up to date with events, training, workshops, more, uh, more BIC brunches, etc and other things. Um, there are two big bites on Thema on our website. These are just two sides of A4, just short papers um, looking at Thema. One is like an introduction to Thema and the second one is more of a, a, a Thema for booksellers. So do have a look at that. Um, and then again, the, a reminder of the operational FAQs um, at, the, at the bottom of the, the screen there. <clears throat> so um, thank you to our to all of our speakers um, so thank you for your time today thank you for your preparation and everything else um, including the, the technical uh, session we had this morning so thank you for your your time um, for that as well um, I don't think I've got anything else to say if you would like to follow us on Twitter there's our hashtag um, and also our address on Twitter for those of you still using it and go to our website all the information that I've referred to today can be found on there as well so um, once again thank you to Adam, Simon, Kieran, Chris and Juana and hope to see you at a future big event sometime soon so that's the end of today's session so thank you everyone bye bye thank you, thank bye. you. bye